So I, um, I've always um, had a, um, a passion for human rights, actually from, from a, a fairly young age. So I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was 13. Oh my actually. goodness. Um, and it was, I just wanted to ensure that, um, that we were speaking up for those who, who didn't have a voice in society. Um, and then I went to see the careers advisor who told me it's very competitive law, um, you might not want to do that and I don't think you'll get the grades for it, which thankfully I completely ignored. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About It. For those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, Let's Talk About It is our educational mini-series where we sit down and talk with professionals about issues surrounding modern slavery and human trafficking. My name is Antonia and I'm the co-host of the podcast and I work here at Hope for Justice. Today I'm here with Philippa and we're going to be talking about being a lawyer in the non-profit sector. So Philippa, I uh, would love to hear who who are you? What's your role at Hope for Justice? Um, maybe introduce yourself a little bit. I'm Philippa Roberts, Head of Policy and Research at, at Hope for Justice, but I'm also a lawyer as well. So <laughs> I work on our policy and reform work globally. And, and that's more about how do we how do we end slavery? Mm -hmm. and, what, and strategically, how do we end slavery? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, what your day-to-day -day looks like? What does it look like being a lawyer in the non-profit and, and charity sector? Well, primarily I'm using my law skills, but I'm not doing much law lawyer kind of work. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more working on the, the kind of policy side, but there's a, a big intersection between mm -hmm. um, uh, law and legislation and policy. Of course. Um, so my day can be extremely varied. It might be doing a briefing paper, it might be doing some research, meeting mm -hmm. with parliamentarians, uh, meeting with other people in the sector because we do work collaboratively on policy both internationally and nationally. Mm -hmm. um, it might be doing some engagement with some of the, the wider um, United Nations kind of actors, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, or it could be doing a speaking engagement and talking about things like the legal rights of, of survivors. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your career journey then? So, um, you know, your lawyer, which is re really, really cool. Um, I myself have a law background, so I definitely mm -hmm. admire um, the legal sphere. So can you tell us a little bit about your career journey of becoming a lawyer and then choosing to to join the nonprofit and the charity sector? Like what kind of inspired you to to go to Hope for Justice and to also work in this sector in general? So I um, I've always um, had a, um, a passion for human rights, actually from, from a, a fairly young age. So mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was 13. Oh, my actually. goodness. Um, and. It was. I just wanted to ensure that um, that we were speaking up for those who who didn't have a voice in society. Mm. Um, and then I went to see the careers advisor, who told me it's very competitive law. Mm -hmm. um, you might not want to do that, and I don't think you'll get the grades for it. Which, thankfully, I completely ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, and um, ended up obviously going to university. But um, I think. Um, I very much see my work as a lawyer intersecting with, with faith and mm -hmm. being a Christian and um, that intersection between uh, passion for justice mm -hmm. um, and actually um, that working out in practice. Uh, and for me, uh, the law really came alive mm -hmm. when I started working on um, issues around modern slavery mm -hmm. um, that actually it's an incredible privilege to be able to use your uh, skills as a lawyer mm -hmm. to ensure that people who are the most vulnerable in society are um, protected and supported. I'm sure our listeners would love to hear what kind of skills that you're you're talking about. So there's maybe some examples of the of the different skills that you've gotten from your from your legal um, career that you use in um, your policy work. I think um, just in in terms of I I went from very much working in private practice. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, head of travel and international litigation mm -hmm. um, in 
private practice working on one area of law. Mm -hmm. so I went on a trip to um, India with a, an organisation mm -hmm. um, out to uh, work the international justice mission we're doing mm -hmm. um, in India around bonded labour and that was my first real exposure um, to slavery and the fact that slavery was still going yeah. on in the world and actually that was quite overwhelming to look at the data and the statistics around that but I, I think one thing I, I never forgot that the, the survivors that I saw the little girl who was in in slavery and I thought well maybe um, I might not be able to help the millions mm -hmm. but I can do something uh, for the one and, and everyone can actually do something for the one person. Mm. And actually I first heard about Hope for Justice whilst I was in India. Mm. Uh, there was this organisation setting up in Manchester uh -huh. and then um, and that's I started volunteering for Hope for Justice. Um, and I think then um, I probably am employee number three or four oh in Hope goodness. for Justice. Wow. Oh my goodness. So you've really seen the organisation form and grow, which has just been I mean, I'm sure probably amazing to see. Do you have any um, favourite memories or favourite stories from seeing the organisation grow? I think in terms of like, um, um, I think that actually for me, seeing things like um, some of the strategy that I put in place, like mm -hmm. uh, things around, well, how do we identify survivors, mm -hmm. uh, training and, and some of that frontline work uh, around um communities and training of um, frontline professionals around trafficking mm -hmm. um, and then seeing the results of that um, of, of survivors being uh, identified uh, and safeguarded as mm -hmm. a result of, of those uh, bits of work and collaborations on the ground with other organisations um, and actually seeing that grow and, and grow and grow in terms of the number of people we've um, then been able to help both yeah. uh, nationally but also then um, internationally, internationally well, too. Yeah. Oh, it must be brilliant to have, have seen that journey as well. Um, and as we talk about, you know, national and international growth, I also wanted to ask your expertise about, um, you know, international policy in general. So. You know, when we look at, you know, the US versus the UK versus Europe versus all over the world, we can see that there are different types of modern slavery legislation. And for our listeners out there, I wanted to ask you, you know, why that is? Why does every country have a different legislation? Why isn't there this kind of unifying thing? Why does why does modern slavery still exist from a from a policy standpoint? Um, would love to hear your your take on that. Well, first of all, modern it's a complex issue, yeah, and we've got to accept that it's a complex issue, and it crosses multiple forms of policy. So there are specific international treaties for instance like the Palermo Protocol mm -hmm. um, on human trafficking and that sets an international legal framework mm -hmm. of how, how um, governments um, and how internationally we should approach the issue of slavery so mm -hmm. um, internationally we'll be talk about the the peas mm -hmm. so um, prevention yeah. of exploitation mm -hmm. um, the protection of victims, so that means the identification and on and support for um, victims and survivors, mm -hmm. um, prosecutions. But I would say actually, mm -hmm. um, um, we need to look wider than the, the criminal justice response to full response on perpetrator accountability mm -hmm. um, that that covers both um, kind of criminal justice, civil justice, labour enforcement, uh, restorative justice approaches yeah. and also the role that a key role that businesses play in in compliance. Definitely and like looking into their supply chains as well and making sure that everything is is ethical and tracked and monitored there too. Absolutely and I will say the final P which is around partnerships mm -hmm. and that's really important so um, both international and national um, collaboration at a national level and even a local level um, is absolutely important. We've got to think that traffickers uh, behave in a way they are entrepreneurial, they're innovative, 
they are collaborative, they work in partnership. And actually, if we're going to combat this crime, then we've got to be entrepreneurial, mm. we've got to be innovative, we have to be collaborative, and we need to work in partnership, both um, state and non-state actors, uh, working also with those with lived experience, both at an international level, a national level, and a localised level. Yes, definitely. I feel like that, you know, that last P that you talk about partnership is one of maybe most important because, you know, when we look at modern slavery and human trafficking, just how complex this problem is, it's one of those things that, you know, one person alone is never going to be able to do it. Like you Absolutely. talked about before, we need to be kind of working all together to, to solve this. So when we're looking towards um, international leadership then in general and the kind of sovereignty of different nation states and how they approach legislation, um, we'd love to hear your kind of expertise and um, knowledge on why different countries have different forms of modern slavery legislation. Why, why does that exist? Well, firstly, we should all be ensuring that our le legislation at uh, the uh, national level okay. is matching the overreaching international legal framework mm -hmm. and is covering the responsibilities that um, states and governments sign up to at that international uh, level. Mm -hmm. um, and largely that international um, framework and le legal and policy framework um, is about ensuring that there are effective measures around prevention, protection, so identification and, and support of survivors. Uh, and that could include things like effective national referral mechanisms, systems for the identification, safeguarding and support of survivors. Um, ensuring that um, there is um, effective prosecution uh, mm -hmm. of perpetrators, but I would say more widely ensuring that there is a, a broader approach to perpetrator accountability mm -hmm. than just criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, ensuring um, perpetrator accountability, yes, through the criminal justice system, but through civil justice, labour enforcement, uh, restorative justice approaches, um, and um, ensuring that there is um, effective legislation around business and human rights and, and compliance. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And you talk about, um, you know, furthering this kind of um, prosecution to a more societal and civil level. I think kind of this idea of um, society comes into it a little bit more when it comes to how people understand the issue of modern slavery and the issue of the legislation that surrounds it. It's something that, you know, we're not all, all lawyers, we're not all yeah. policy um, experts, so sometimes it can be really difficult to kind of read between the lines and understand what this bill means or what um, that act means. Um, so when we're thinking about advice to our listeners and people who are listening in, maybe wanting to understand a little bit more about different policies, whether that be in the US or the UK um, or anywhere that we are based, what would your kind of advice be when approaching policy and trying to kind of learn more about legislation? Well, that's a question and a half. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, it, firstly, we'll learn what policy is in play. So there are, there are key things that you, you, you should look, look for mm -hmm. um, in terms of an effective approach. Firstly, there needs to be really clear governance mm -hmm. and leadership Mm -hmm. over the issue in a, a country both uh, and at international level as well I would say mm -hmm. um, is there a clear strategy mm. and is that strategy monitored and evaluated because actually if we have a strategy but we don't know whether it's working or not yeah and, and that is about effective well. yeah that's about effective monitoring and uh, mm -hmm. evaluation yeah definitely so what I'm hearing here is more about looking at, you know, what's currently in place, what's being proposed, whether that matches the international obligations and the international protocols that are in place. Um, and if it doesn't, making sure that you can maybe 
you know, contact your, your senator, your MP, depending on where you're based, um, and, you know, advocate for yourself and advocate for others to make sure that those acts are, are being pushed and are monitored and tracked in the right way, and especially by third parties as well, to making sure that those are not just monitored by the people who have invented them and just kind of making sure that things are all legitimate and, and tracked well um, as well. One thing that would assist... Um, it- at an international level is having an overreaching, clear international governance structure uh, that draws together different actors. Um, So, for instance, research by the Policy Evidence Centre, which was commissioned by Theresa May, has put forward a need for a global commission and we would support that need. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the research conducted showed that it was compelling evidence for a need for a global commission on modern slavery and human trafficking that actually would um, ensure that it was um, overreaching political leadership, build the evidence and knowledge base of what works, Mm -hmm. and also promote and facilitate that collaboration between the states, Mm -hmm. um, multilateral organisations, so that be um, organisations such as the United Nations, civil society, business, um, researchers, and and importantly within that, those with lived experience. Definitely. And what you said there, I just really want to want to highlight that, that you know, those with lived experience really need to have their voices amplified and make sure that they're the ones that can help, um, you know, guide this policy because they're the ones who know exactly what it's like and exactly the kind of policies that will both help and hinder their situations as well. Yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, we're not the experts in the field, they mm-hmm. are. Exactly. Exactly. What, in your opinion, are the world's governments doing about modern slavery? And then what can we do as individuals? I think it's important that we recognise we all have a voice. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, what drives um, policy in the area ultimately is political will. Mm -hmm. We have to have political will Mm -hmm. um, to drive the issue forward, both at, at an international and national level. Mm-hmm. And can you explain to me a little bit um, what do you mean by political will? It means that those who actually have influence and can create change both at an international level and at a national level are engaged on this issue, they're driving forward this issue mm-hmm. and we are ensuring that actually we have appropriate legislation, policy and practice but more importantly the resources mm-hmm. to ensure that that actually is uh, working on the ground in, in practice. Mm-hmm. So if we have and sign up to international legal frameworks mm-hmm. but actually there's a massive implementation gap yeah those the purpose of those international frameworks that mm-hmm. becomes redundant if we're not acting on those and those are not working in practice mm-hmm. exactly i think um people maybe underestimate the power that they have as citizens as individuals you know to be able to to vote and to use their political voices in order to kind of make this change you know um political actors whether that's uh, national governments international governments even local governments all act based on what their constituents want and what their constituents say so if we're voting if we're signing petitions if we're you know going out and and involving ourselves in protests or activism that's all ways of using our political voice to influence the the change that we want to see and and absolutely and you will find on our websites Mm -hmm. there there will be you know ongoing campaigns Mm -hmm. that people can get involved in so i guess the, the the last kind of question that i really want to to focus on then is where do you think um current legislation that we have or current policy is moving or maybe should be moving based on the current trends that you've seen working in your day-to-day role? I think we also need, firstly, we need to understand like at that country level, uh, countries are at different stages Mm -hmm. in a journey Mm -hmm. um, around um, implementation or implementation legislation policy practice Mm -hmm. and strategy around uh, modern slavery so we need to meet countries where they are Mm -hmm. um, and support them on those journeys Mm -hmm. Um, 
I think my biggest concern is is a co conflict between such things as immigration policies with policies around human trafficking and um, and seeing wider immigration policies will have a really significant and negative impact on our ability to both prevent exploitation, identify uh, victims and ensure that they receive the, the safeguarding and support that they need and ultimately um, Often what we see is where survivors are well supported, um, they are in a position and can make um, choices around whether they want to, for instance, cooperate with criminal investigations. So, um, so central to an, any anti-trafficking strategy should be survivors at the centre of that and those at risk of exploitation, which is, is impo important to literally every aspect of an anti-trafficking -strat strategy working mm -hmm. in practice. And a key, key aspect of um, really effective legislation and, and policy is firstly ensuring that those with lived experience are um, play a major role in developing um, that, that policy, but also ensuring that actually legislation and policy is evidence-based. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and we had a huge episode a couple a couple of episodes ago um, with Sarah, who is our you know monitoring and evaluation specialist, and she was able to talk a little bit about how how she uses data and uses evidence based policy in, in some of our programs, and I feel like that also you know ripples into all of our other work as well. We use evidence and marketing when we talked about it in our comms episode. We use um, data and evidence based language in our in our policies as well. Um, so it's this kind of thing where we're looking at evidence-based um, strategy across kind of all sectors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Philippa, for joining us today. Um, that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much.